Thank you for tuning in to the Practical Preservation Podcast. Please take a moment to visit our website, practicalpreservationservices.com, for additional information and tips to help you restore your historical home. If you've not done so, please subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud, and also like us on Facebook. Welcome to the Practical Preservation Podcast, hosted by Danielle and Jonathan Kepperling. Kepperling Preservation Services is a family-owned business based in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, dedicated to the preservation of our built architectural history for today's use as well as future generations. Our weekly podcast provides you with expert advice specific to the unique needs of renovating a historic home, educating by sharing our From the Trenches preservation knowledge and our guests' expertise, balancing modern needs while maintaining the historical significance, character, and beauty of your period home. Today on the Practical Preservation Podcast, we have Dwayne Seaver with us from uh, the Real Milk Paint Company. So Dwayne, thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you, Danielle. I appreciate okay, being so, able to come today. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited. Um, so tell me, tell me about your background. Well, um, as far as how we started the company, and, and uh, you know, I grew up originally in Pennsylvania and went to a vocational technical school for uh, woodworking, carpentry, and cabinet making. And uh, I had a really influential teacher named Warner DeWork, who was from the guild system out of Germany and, uh, you know, entered into the, the vocational technical school system to teach us kids, rambunctious bunch of kids, how to do dovetails and use a hand plane and sharpen hand tools, and chisels. And it was really an awesome uh, time, you know, for, for the, the vocational system. In my oh, mind. yes. I know that. Now there seems to be a resurgence by, you know, a number of well-known people to bring that back. But, um, you know, unfortunately that died out or it seemed to have died out, you know, the hand skills that were yes, yeah. in woodworking. So that's, that's kind of where I started at. Okay. And I, I did see on your website, I guess, did, did he introduce you to like the, the more historic finishes or was that something you discovered later on after you were out of school? Yeah, well, while I was there, we had a, a really famous antique dealer come to, to, to the Votech school named, named Philip Bradley, and he was looking for cabinet makers to work in his shop. And so I really had no experience with antique furniture, you know, Sheridan, William & Mary, you know, Chippendale, uh, you know, all those people, people or, you know, styles. Styles, yes. Yeah. You, know, you know, if you want to call them people, because there were people behind that. But, <laughs> They introduced, you know, and I went down to his shop and I was just amazed. I mean, the woodwork was incredible. The dovetails were so tight and these things were hundreds of years old. And uh, so I started working for him on Saturdays and he really introduced me to, to, to that, to that whole field of antique furniture and his, you know, I mean, we learned about history in high school, but they never talked about furniture and furniture styles. And, you know, so to me, it was like, wow, all this stuff existed, you know, way back in the founding of our country. And, you know, you know, I just, you know, you never hear about it. I mean, you're talking right. about the political stuff, and the history, but not about the thing, the furniture and the furnishings that went along with it. So um, I had some salesmen that worked the floor there that, that I was like, hey, I want to learn about this. But, you know, how did you learn about it? And where do I go? And so they started feeding me books and information about it. And um, so after I graduated from high school, I went to work for a guy named uh, Howard Shimolko up in um, Solberry, Pennsylvania. And he did a reproductions as well as did re furniture restoration. Okay. So, so I learned a lot from him. And then from there, I went to work with a guy named Alan Miller. And we did a whole bunch of furniture for, for the Metropolitan and all the auction houses in New York. And really high-end Philadelphia, highly carved mahogany and uh, walnut furniture. And so uh, learning about old surfaces and how to do uh, ring-orientated patching on, on pieces and really make your furniture make all those patches disappear. Oh, yes. Yeah, so yeah. that's where I really got in, got, got a lot of my experience and knowledge about furniture. And of course, then I had to go out on my own. You know, right. And do my own thing. So um, 
I mean, I don't know how much further you want me to, you know. Well, I, I, I am, I am interested. So is that after you went out on your own doing, were you, re, were you restoring uh, furniture? Were you building reproductions? What were you doing when you were out on your own? Yeah. I, I mean, I always had, I always liked to fix things. I mean, as a, even as a kid, anything that broke in the house, the hairdryer, the toaster, one of the terror parts. To <laughs> so furniture, I was like, wow, there's all this stuff out there that needs repaired. So I opened up my shop and I, I started going to Lambertville in New Hope, Pennsylvania, or Lambertville, New Jersey. And I, I started picking up a, a, a client list of, of antique dealers. Now, they, they were selling a lot of, you know, brown, what they call brown furniture. So it was like uh, some antique furniture, some, you know, 50s and 60s furniture. But, you know, so I had a lot of broad spectrum of things to repair on it. Usually they wanted a turnover, you know, pretty quickly. So I was trying to turn things over within a week. You know, oh my goodness. Yeah. So, I mean, from doing, doing, you know, full piano, 12 inch finishes on, on 12 foot dining room tables, you know, and, you know, uh, to restoration on, on, uh, you know, carved items and, you know, learning how to get, how to deal with, uh, with polished brass. And, you know, so it was, it was, it was quite varied experience with, with, uh, furniture. And, you know, of course there was the country market too, the country painted pieces, and that's, oh, yes. where, that's where the, the antique market really started, you know, the primitives and the country painted pieces. And, you know, I remember having a, a blanket chest come in and I had to do a, a piece of molding, match a piece of molding on it, match the, 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 the uh, paint that was on there. And I was just like, and I went to Sherwin Williams and these places and, and I had them match the paint and I was like, but it didn't match. And right. Like, it was what? the right color, but it wasn't, it wasn't yeah. the right texture. Right, and it just it, it it was it wasn't porous and was slick and shiny. And I was like, something's not right about this. And it's like, what am I missing? You know. And so then I started gathering old books and and starting to research. Well, you know, before they had commercially made paint, you know, what did they use? What 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 happened? You know, if we're you know what were these guys using back in the day when you couldn't go to the hardware store? So. That's how the milk paint really started. And I, I still remember the, uh, the first time I, I made, I had a European cupboard and I went and told my wife, I said, I'm going to paint this with milk paint. She's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> milk, milk paint? They're, that, like, she's like, yeah, that's crazy. You know? And, and so I, I made it, I painted it like blue and, and uh, yellow ochre with yellow ochre trim and we had that as a, like an entertainment center in our house for years and years and years. And that, I mean, the paint just held up amazingly well. And uh, from that point, I was just like, wow, this stuff's really great. And, you know, I was able to do textures with it and, you know, make age surfaces. And I was just like, there's got to be a real interest in this outside of my little spectrum here. Right. So, yes. So this was kind of like before the Internet, you know, I mean, this is when people were still doing advertising in newspapers. And- <laughs> You know, and yeah, I saw. Product. Was it was it in the mid nineties? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I so, I was I was in high school at that time, and I remember I had we had to take a word perfect class, which was really just typing with the screen, and yeah. um, the 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 computer teacher announced that we were not going to discuss the internet because it was a fad, and we were never we weren't going to talk about it. <laughs> and did you do DOS? We did. did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, my, my wife was a typesetter for. Oh, okay. Like, for yeah. Schools were typesetting for a newspaper. Imagine this. This is like people like, what's a typesetter? <laughs> yeah. But this is when, you know, I, I mean, I remember first getting my the first internet hookup in my workshop and I, I was trying to get online and the, and the guy was telling me, well, you got to set up your email. You know, it's Dwayne Siever at whatever.com. And I'm just like, man, I'm typing it in and I just can't get in there. And he's, he's like, what's going on? I said, well, I'm putting Dwayne Siever AT. Oh goodness. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't even, I was like, so what I was like at the at symbol, like what's that? You know? So I was calling technical support cause I didn't know anything about computers at all. So, and that doesn't seem, honestly, it doesn't seem all that long ago. It wasn't that long ago. The world has, the world, ha, the, the technology has accelerated quickly. Now we're all carrying computers around with us. <laughs> yeah. So I set up the first, our first, well, in, in, to, to make the milk paint, first I came out with a brochure and I, I started gathering uh, pigments. And I figured other people needed to know where 
how needed different colors of pigments and where they came from. So I had about 27 different colors of pigments. And on the back of this brochure, just a printed brochure, I had two ways to make milk paint from raw materials. Well, I was getting calls and people were like, yeah, that's all cool and that's neat and all that stuff. But who wants to gather all that stuff up? That's just too much work. And, you know, once I kept hearing that a number of times, I was like, well, obviously people are interested in something, but they want it easy. Right. You know, one step product. So, I mean, and the milk paint that I made for that cupboard, you know, worked awesome. And I told people how to use it. You know, all they had to do was make it themselves, but they didn't want it that way. They wanted something Right. That yeah. They wanted it easier. Yep. So I had a, a, a closet in my workshop that actually was a bathroom. It wasn't a bathroom yet. So it was basically <laughs> a closet. And I started experimenting with, with dry powders and formulas that, that I could use to make dry powdered milk paint. And I had a, and I had, finally, after about a year of experimenting, I came up with a formula that actually had better adhesion, worked better, mixed smoother, you know, had, had really good color. And I was like, well, this is it. I'm, we got to try this out. And um, we packaged up about 12 colors and we went to an, an, a weekend antique show and I sold a thousand dollars worth of packaged paint that weekend. And I was that, just like, yeah. this is it. We're off and running. <laughs> We're in business now. Yes. Did people come back then? Like, were, or did word spread then among the a- antique dealers? And it did. Okay. Uh, and we still have we still have one uh, Americana workshop up in Maine. She's still one of my retailers from 25 years ago, from that first paint we sold. You know, in a in a little paper bag. You know, it was actually we made it different then. It was two parts. You had the pigment powder was in a little bag, and the milk paint base was in another Ziploc bag. Had to dump them together and mix them, and yeah. mix it up, just mix it up, and then add the water. But um, yeah, so so yeah, it, it 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 spread fairly rapidly at that point. I mean, and then the the internet came online, and and I was I was working with the township. I was on a board, and I started talking with the gal beside me, and and, and found out that she did website design. So I was like, well, that's cool. What can we do? I don't have a lot of money. And she's like, well, I need an end table. So oh, refin- that's perfect. <laughs> so, so I found this end table. I refinished it for her, and I traded her for a website. <laughs> that that that's that's always a great way to get things that you need. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's how our our first website got online for the real milk paint company. Oh, very cool. And then did that? Did you find that that um, people found you online then, and and you start to in- expand your geographic reach? Yeah, that I mean, that's how we, we dove in 100% online, didn't do a whole lot of, of, of print advertising, just really saw that was the future of right. reaching out to people. And and I, I my, my focus initially was, you know, I know this is, you know, about preservation, and that's what my initial focus was. Right. A lot of people started coming to us because they wanted environmentally safe products. They wanted things that were all natural and not toxic to the environment. And yeah, so, and there is a definite overlap between preservation and 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 sustainable building and and environment and things that are friendly for the environment. So absolutely. I could I could see why you know that those people people would also be attracted to that. Yeah, and and we still service both markets. Yes. Mm-hmm. So is your is your work pri- primarily preservation based, or is it is it a mixture of people who want more natural? products and then people who want to you know refinish things so that they look older it's a mixture of both okay i mean it really is i mean we'll have interiors of historic homes um i mean recently had hence it was called the uh thunder house it's in the philadelphia museum and it was a reproduction that was being made of something benjamin franklin made uh to, to, to illustrate lightning and and uh that's actually you know re, they made it they made a secondary one but they repainted it with our milk paint you know, to duplicate the paint oh, yes. that was used at the time. So, I mean, it goes both ways. I mean, we, we sell the, uh, we've sold the tongue oil to historic uh, sites for uh, coating the interiors and rafters and paneling. And um, we've also sold the milk paint for historic barns and, you know, for, for both the exterior and interior. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, um, I, when you said tongue oil, is it just um, like pure tongue oil? Is that, or is it like a mixture? Hundred percent pure tongue oil. Okay. But we have a, a variety of, of thinners, uh, natural thinners like citrus solvent, 
And we've also created a product called Outdoor Defense Oil, which is pure tongue oil, pine oil, and zinc. And so it, they're all natural products, but, you know, proved to be very durable. Okay. Very, very, very interesting. Um, so tell me, I know we've talked a little bit, but tell me about your products, your services. I know that there's a lot of different colors and things on your website. Like what, um, if, if you needed to tell somebody what, what you, what you have to offer, what would you tell them? Yeah, we, we have 57 colors of milk paint and they're, they're, they're easy to work with. They're just a one part powder, one part water. They're hundred percent natural. They breathe. They're environmentally safe. And matter of fact, in the end, you can actually, if you have leftover paint, it's good fertilizer for your garden. So, I mean, you really can't get safer paint than that. Right. Then, I mean, our other category is our tongue oils. So we have the 100% pure tongue oil. Then we also make another tongue oil product we call dark raw tongue oil, which is tongue oil with a natural resin added, added to it. Then stepping down from there, we take those, those, those pure tongue oils, the dark raw and the pure, and we add solvents to them to make them better absorb into wood. And we use, we use the citrus solvent, which is 100% natural, comes from the peel of the orange. And uh, at, then we call those 50-50 or half and half, Okay. You know, pure tongue oil, and then we have dark half, which is dark tongue oil mixed 50% with citrus solvent. And those are hugely popular that people who, who want to have 100%, you know, natural interiors, you know, for both their wood floors. Oh, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Cabins. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not shiny either, because I know that a lot of people especially in preservation, try to get away from shiny, but sometimes if you're using, you know, some of the the polyurethane based things there you can't get away from shine right these are these are matte very yeah. matte yeah and tongue oil was in, was imported into this country early on i mean early, i mean the earliest formulas were made with linseed oil because that that was grown here but tongue oil i can't say exactly when tongue oil started to hit our market but it's just much more durable less prone to mold and mildew um, still 100 percent natural so that's that's the reason why historic preservation is more interested in the tongue oil over the linseed oil. Um, right. And linseed yeah, like oil, I had known that linseed oil and linseed oil based paint had issues with mildew and things depending on what climate you're in. So I yep. had, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, you talked a little bit about um, using milk paint on like furniture and on interiors and exteriors. Um, the exterior, we've never actually used milk paint on an exterior, but we're getting ready to. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm kind of curious about that. Is it, um, um, is it like, what is the lifespan of it? Is it, is it pretty durable? Um, I know you said it's breathable, so I would think that would make it last longer. Yeah. Okay. Well, probably the, the key to using an exterior is one, it has to be an absorbent surface. So it's gotta be raw wood or concrete, um, you know, for it to absorb into the, the secondary thing to talk about is, you know, how long do we want it to last? And we can do add certain things to it to make it, or you can as the consumer to right. make it last longer. One way to make the milk paint last two to three times as long as you actually mix 20% pure tongue oil into it. So you mix it with water, uh, milk paints are very, as a natural emulsion. Then you add 20% tongue oil to it of the pure tongue oil. It, it doesn't ever separate out. And that makes the milk paint super durable, seven to 10 years, easy exterior. The nice, the nice thing about the milk paint in the exterior is it is breathable, but it wears away and it'll never blister and peel. So, so you don't have to deal with that prep then. So you just kind of yeah. let it, do you just kind of let it um, weather away and then put a new coat on? Is that exactly your recommendation? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you don't want to paint every year because that'll build up and get too thick, and then you might have crackling or you know right. flaking issues. But part of the problem with a lot of historic sites is they're they're using latexes or right. acrylics, and they're trapping the moisture underneath a plastic blanket. Oh and yeah, so yeah, we've we've experienced that with some of the um, even like some of the park service projects we've done where they. They, it seems like they want to try out the new kind of paint and then we, and then, and then we're struggling because the one, I can't even remember what was in it, but I, my husband would always say, if you just look at it, it's going to peel. And it was peeling before we even finished the install. You yeah. know, it, it was terrible. I mean, what some of the customers we have, we still, we sell pigment powders 
just like we did in the beginning. Yes. They'll buy the pigment powders and then they mix them in with pure tongue oil, basically make a tongue oil paint. Oh. And I have a, we have a guy in the Midwest that, that he, he does all of his decks for his clients that way. Because that would get you the pigment, but then the tongue oil would really absorb into the wood. Right. Yeah. And it locks the pigment, you know, to the wood. And then you get the durability and the longevity of the, of the tongue oil mix. But basically, instead of a linseed oil paint, you have a tongue oil paint. That's very interesting. So, and um, I know you talked about the environmental and, and earth friendly aspects of milk paint. Um, and I, there was a lot on your website about VOC. So there, are there no VOCs in, in the milk paint? There are no VOCs in the milk paint okay. at all. Zero. It's just water that evaporates out of it. Um, as far as the VOCs go with, with the tongue oil, if we add the citrus solvent to it, the citrus solvent is a natural VOC. Okay. And that, a lot of people get, get, you know, VOCs can be identified. I mean, when you smell a rose, you're smelling a VOC, you know, because it's a volatile organic chemical. Right. So that's, what, that, that's what's evaporating into the air. So, of course, there's toxic VOCs and there's natural VOCs. So the citrus solvent is, is just repurposed from the peel of the orange. If they would dump all the orange peels from the orange juice industry outside into the dump, that would just, all, the citrus solvent would evaporate into the air. Right. It, it yeah. would. So instead of letting, wasting that for there, you know, in the dump, you know, taking it and repurposing it to be used to do other things like fragrances and uh, it's used as a food additive for, for just, just, just the odor. I mean, yes. Yeah. We've seen a huge, from the, when we started buying citrus solvent, there's been a huge increase and um, certainly a lot more competition for, for buying the product because they don't seem to be planting more orange groves. I don't know why they should. <laughs> <laughs> they really need them. Right. Well, and I wonder, I, I don't, I don't know where you get them from, but I'm thinking like you could just get the, um, the people who are making orange juice, you just need the peels. They don't need the, <laughs> they don't need the peels. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but yeah, and we're not, we're well, and you're now, you're now in Tennessee. Is that correct? You've moved from Pennsylvania. Yeah. We moved seven years ago yeah. from Pennsylvania to Tennessee and for, for a lot of reasons, yeah. wanted to build a bigger facility. Um, the other thing to be more centralized in the country uh, so that we could ship better. Oh, to, that makes both, sense. Yeah. yeah. Both East, East and West coast. And, uh, you know, and honestly, Tennessee has a great tax structure right. for, for, for businesses. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't get any favors, you know, that way, but just, it's just, it's just a much lower tax right. than, than there is in other, uh, Eastern States. Yeah. I, I could see that. I was just, I was just thinking you should have moved to Florida and you could have orange, orange groves in the backyard. <laughs> Yeah, far, I mean, we, we do get product from, and it's really not that far away by truck, you know. Really? So, oh, that's not, that's, that's in good. Georgia, down in Florida, I mean, like, you know, seven, ten hours. Oh, that's not bad at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do you have, um, do you, I, I know that you're just selling, like, the product to, to, to conser- consumers, but are, do, you, do you get feedback? Do you hear about any, you know, prominent or interesting products that you're, that you're, or projects that your product is used on? One of our projects, you, you know, a historic project that was used on years ago was the, the New Bold White House in Hereford, North Carolina, and, and it's a historic project, and they actually painted the outside of the, the building with our red milk paint. And okay. recently they've come back to us because it's, it's worn off, it's done its thing, it's protected. And they've come back to us again and said, hey, we need to do some touch up on this project. Um, so th- they've ordered more paint to, to go back and, and repaint again. And that's probably- Is that um, because of the pigments, is that hard then to match so many years apart or is it is it get close enough? Yeah, the pig. I mean, we're still using the same pigment. They chose right. red, red oxide pigment. Okay. That, in their discovery, that's what they realized was our, it was originally painted with. So the red oxide, we, we've been using the same red oxide comes out of Virginia, you know, so it's, it's sourced, you know, in the United States. So right. that's been, the, that's, I mean, it was a very easy match. And the pigments themselves don't really fade out. They, they kind of will run off as, as the milk paint, gives up the protein bond starts to give up then they start to kind of run off into the soil and you know it more wood becomes exposed right so, 
Yeah, but yeah, matching it, they can do very easy match if they want to do a wash or you know a full full paint again. Yeah, um, the and as the pigments wash away because everything's natural, it's not going to hurt anything. Does it ever stain though, like the the walls? If there's concrete underneath, I mean, okay, it, it could it could you know leave yeah. some residue on that. You know, no doubt, you know, some a little bit of red residue, um, but. I mean, we've never gotten any complaints about that. Right. Yeah. I just was thinking that could be something to, especially if you're using a darker color, I think that would be more, more, more of a concern. Yeah. Um, I guess if you had a lime washed or lime, lime, you know, base or, you know, um, you know, historic lime plaster, you know, that was white, you know, I guess that could be a problem if you didn't have yeah. enough overhang to yeah. let it run off. So um, I, uh, what, I know we kind of talked about the the beginning of your business, but are, is there anything that you wish that you knew when you started that you know now? <laughs> Gosh, you, you know, it, it, it's it's interesting that that I mean, the, every day I feel like I know less and less. So, <laughs> you know, but the more I find out, the more I realize, man, I just I just really don't know, hardly know anything, you know. But I guess if I, I guess if I was going to do things over again that I wish I knew, I wish I would have went to college for organic chemistry you know, oh yeah to, to have a better grasp on that because I, I just love you know the idea of, of putting things together from things that naturally occur you know and, and not necessarily things from the petroleum industry or fracked or cracked but just like you know the, the you know the, the, the resins from different trees and you know the fibers that are naturally produced you know, right of course. yeah I would I would think that there's so much in that to learn and to then understand how everything works together or, um, you know, you can combine them. But yeah. you, you, you didn't, you didn't really know that was going to be your path when you start out making, um, you know, antique reproductions. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Yeah. And I mean, I've, I've also learned how to make different waxes by combining carnauba wax and beeswax and, and, uh, uh, you know, you know, there's actually a number of different waxes we use to make our paste waxes now. So that's been a whole new mission, you know, to, to learn the different properties, uh, not necessarily petroleum waxes, but, you know, all the natural waxes. Some are right. harder, some are softer, some are emulsifiers, you know. Um, so, you know, some will, some will sweat with solvent, some won't, you know. So it's learning how to, and like carnauba wax being very hard, you know, has to be, mixed with a softer wax like beeswax so that it becomes you know a workable wax so that that's some of those things i guess you, you probably wouldn't have learned in college anyway it's more just you know trial and error right so. right but now now you um you can you can document and and help future future people that are looking for natural solutions also yeah because I mean, you know that trial and error i think is a lot of the times you know the 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 knowledge that's passed on that you know we don't we don't necessarily value because we're down in the trenches every day but <laughs> you know that you that you start to realize everybody doesn't know this <laughs> I mean, true i mean one of the recipes you know getting back to like you know, the original recipes one of the recipes for milk paint of course was you know milk wine and animal fat and they would use lard or render and the lime itself would actually you know dissolve the animal fat and that was the waterproofing now, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I mean, that's organic chemistry. You know, yeah. but they didn't think about it as organic chemistry. Back no. Then. That's, that's what it was. Yeah. So do you see challenges or trends uh, within preservation? I, I think, you know, I had a, a, an old house that was built in the 1890s, and I, 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 I restored it as much as I could before we moved. And the people that bought it have been very good stewards. And when I was searching for products, especially when it came to window restoration, you know, and how, how do we keep these old windows? Right. And, uh, you know, so I think that, that you know, and, and people not, people understanding first growth woods, you know, and how important they are. And right. The, I, I think those are the things that, that the, the public is not necessarily still educated about. And I think a lot of things from a historic point of view in, in regard to preservation of those materials is still going, still getting wasted, still getting thrown away. I mean, I agree with you 
um, I've heard, and I don't know like what the source was, that 80% of the windows in America have been replaced. Yeah. Um, and I was watching, I don't usually watch daytime TV, but I was watching daytime TV a couple weeks ago for something. And it was, there was like a window, you know, you need to replace your window commercial. And it was like, if your windows are, are more than 10 years old, they're very drafty. And I'm thinking, you're, they, they shouldn't be. <laughs> Right. <laughs> they're just trying to get you to buy new windows <laughs> and i would in the, in the house i restored all the old windows that were there you know painted them with milk paint and and they were painted with latex or some kind of acrylic paint so you couldn't slide them up and down oh yeah and and so the milk paint is 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 kind of brittle so but it allows the the, the with a little bit of wax it lets the windows slide up and down like a dream so um I hope that the new owners keep those windows for a long, long time because uh, they, they, I mean, I, I hopefully did a great job restoring. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And window restoration, I mean, it's a skill, but it's something that's pretty replicable and you, you, you know, so if people want to restore them, them themselves, you know, we'll talk to them and tell them what they need to do. And then my joke is always start in the back of the house. Cause by the time you get to the front, they're going to look a lot better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, how can our listeners contact you? Well, we, we got a couple of shows coming up. Okay. You know, we got April 17th through 19th. We're doing the, the fine woodworking live in Sturbridge, Massachusetts. We're, actually, we're going to be there as a vendor, but Nancy Hiller, who's also a famous uh, author, she's going to be demonstrating our milk paint for a, a, a fine woodworking live event there. And that was April 17th through 19th okay. in Sturbridge, Massachusetts. Then we're also going to be at the uh, American Association of Woodturners in Louisville, Kentucky, June 5th through 7th. We're ha we have a booth there that we're going to be set up, uh, meeting with all the woodturners in America, hopefully. And uh, as far as a shameless self-promotion, on our website, we're having what's called a three for free. So if you want three samples of either milk paint or tongue oil, you can buy three samples for three fifty each, and uh, have them shipped to you for free. Okay, very cool. And uh, I'm just I'm making notes so we I make sure that it gets up on the website. And it was the American Association of Wood Turners. That's correct. Okay. Yep. Okay. Very good. And so, the, and 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 all of your contact information, if someone would want to get a hold of you, would also be on your website. Real okay, very good. Did you have anything else that you wanted to share that we didn't get a chance to talk about or go over? Well, I'm trying to think about that. Um, I think we covered, I mean, I could, I could talk all day long about the benefits of milk paint and, and why everybody in America should, could use it and why, you know, everybody has, you know, toxic paint in their basement that they really, you know, should, should get rid of or should right. get around. But the idea of, you know, if we've all switched to a natural paint, you know, that you could use in the end to fertilize your garden or your backyard. I mean, how much healthier would, would the planet be in general? Right. That's true. I, I, when you were talking about that, that just made me think, we talked somewhat about how long the milk paint finish lasts on the exterior. How, on the interior, is it pretty much indefinite because it doesn't get that weather? Yeah. It, okay. It, it won't go away. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well, that's, that was my, that was a question that popped into my brain. Um, I, I appreciate your time and I, I thank you for, um, for coming on to get uh, onto the recording to, for the podcast. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. It was great. I'm glad, I'm glad you contacted me and reached out. Thanks for listening to the Practical Preservation Podcast. The resources discussed during this episode are on our website at practicalpreservationservices.com forward slash podcast. If you received value from this episode and know someone else that will get value from it as well, please share it with them. Join us next week for another episode of the Practical Preservation Podcast. For more information on restoring your historic home, visit practicalpreservationservices.com.